All right, let's jump right in. Keith Eidek is here, senior writer over at BoxingScene.com, and Lance Pugmeyer, senior boxing writer with The Athletic. Fellas, good to have two friends of the podcast on the show this week. What's going on? Nice to be here with you, Chris. Just enjoying the non-bubble life, my man. How you doing? I, it's, it's almost surreal that I'm doing this right now. Like <laughs> I've spent like the last two days like immersed in the minutia of NBA meetings and conversations and now here we are midday on friday it's like let's talk some boxing fellas let's get into it let's do <laughs> let's do hey. junior welterweight championship what's more absurd than what you're dealing with down there than boxing you know that's true it's it's now kind of elevating to to a boxing like level with absurdity at this point but uh it's wild that's for sure but i'm glad we can do this because there is a lot going on that i want to get into in boxing dillian white Alexander Povetkin. I was excited about this one. It lived up to to the expectations. White, through four rounds, looked like he was on his way to another knockout win. Put down Povetkin twice in that fourth round. Povetkin was shaky going into his corner. And then, out of nowhere, the uppercut from hell, straight from Russia, he drops Dillian White down and out before his head could hit the canvas. Keith, uh, shocked by Pavekin's win at all surprise expected it I mean what did you think of that performance well I was certainly shocked after the fourth round that's for sure <laughs> I mean it looked like he was well on his way to getting knocked out and I think you know going into the fight while Povetkin was considered dangerous because he can punch and he, you know he's a former world champion he's almost 41 years old and Dillian White is nine years younger than him and you know had beaten a string of very you know not all of them top top heavyweights but some you know, the Joseph Parker win was very good. The Oscar Rivas win was very good. Obviously came in a very close fight and knocked Derek Chisora unconscious. Uh, so had some huge wins during his winning streak after losing Anthony Joshua. And I commended him for taking, you know, numerous tough fights while he's the WBC mandatory challenger seemingly forever. Um, but he, Dillian White's a flawed fighter in the sense that, you know, he doesn't, he's been down before. I mean, he's been stopped before. So I wasn't, I wasn't stu stunned overall, but I was stunned based on the way the fight was going that that happened. I mean, I think all of us were like, oh, did that just happen? Really? That just, you know, <laughs> you know, look, you, you feel somewhat uh, bad for Dillian White in the sense that he never got his title shot. And, and Eddie Hearn is now talking about him winning this immediate rematch and then becoming the mandatory again. That's not the way it works. You don't get knocked unconscious and then become the mandatory because you beat the guy in the rematch. How about all the guys who haven't lost since you lost? So I don't know about that part of it, but, um, but he also talks a lot of trash and, you know, he, you know, there were a lot of people certainly celebrating him losing in that fashion on Twitter and Instagram and other places. So, um, but, you know, but Chris, how many times have you and I spoken on the podcast about heavyweights taking risks and, and, you know, looking too far ahead to fights that just won't happen because you're going to get caught by one of these huge punchers or dangerous guys at some point. And that's clearly what happened with Dillian White. Lance, I'll tell you, if I had been part of the call for that fight after that fourth round, I would have said something like, Dillian White is a composed and ferocious finisher. Watch this. Uh -oh. and then, <laughs> You've never said that before, have you? Never, never in my life. But <laughs> d does, a, does a fight like this to you say more about Dillian White, or does it say more about Alexander Povetkin? Great question. I mean, obviously you have to give a ton of credit to Povetkin because like you said, I mean, when he, when he retreats to that corner, it does look as if, you know, this is a guy headed into retirement, but he looked within himself and found that resolve and, and delivered that punch. It was amazing theater. And for me, the thing that I'm just blown away by is like what a dramatic turn of events it is for Dillian White because he goes from this, you know, mandatory shot, mandatory position that he was going to be in uh, against the Fury Wilder winner to now, you know, falling so far back in line. I mean, yes, Eddie Hearn may ultimately like throw this guy a bone if Anthony Joshua is the, you know, uh, remains as the heavyweight champion through those Fury fights and he could get a title shot there. But um, so many guys passed him up now because of this loss. And it's just, it shows how, you know, how the chips can fall in the sport. And Dillian White, I mean, I easily could see a situation where he never, you know, gets a, a heavyweight title shot. Keith, uh, Lance brought up Eddie Hearn and you watch him after the broadcast 
and he's like, man, that was tough. Tough to see. That was wild. But inside, he must have been gleeful. I mean, nobody was a bigger winner on Saturday than Eddie Hearn because he has spent the better part of the last three months talking out of both sides of his mouth. He has been trying to make a fight between Anthony Joshua and Tyson Fury while simultaneously trying to stop that fight by making Dillian, by Tyson Fury fight Dillian White. Now, instead of having to get on that merry-go-round every couple of weeks, he can have, he has a clearer path to Joshua versus Fury, still things that obviously Joshua and Fury have to take care of, but Dillian White's not part of that situation anymore. And he has another big money fight. Like there's going to be huge interest in the rematch between Dillian White and and Alexander Povetkin. I mean, I look, I, all the people in that garden on Saturday, Eddie Hearn won the most. Yeah, I mean, there's obviously a lot of interest now in the Povetkin-White rematch. Um, but I think if Eddie, Eddie Hearn has learned anything over the last two years, um, it's that you shouldn't look ahead to anything because we thought that Anthony Joshua was going to fight Deontay Wilder. Look what happened. Um, and anyone who's counting out Deontay Wilder in his third fight against Tyson Fury, I don't know why you would. I understand he, he looked terrible in the rematch and, and Tyson Fury roughed him up and, and embarrassed him to some degree in that fight. But he's one of the most pulverizing punchers in the history of boxing. And I don't know how you could say that he does not have a chance just based on that in the third fight. So while I'd love to see Tyson Fury fight Anthony Joshua and it would be an enormous event in the UK, let's not get ahead of ourselves. Yeah, Lance, we haven't heard much from Deontay Wilder in the last few months. Some Instagram posts here or there. But in the meantime, you've got Tyson Fury taking to social media and basically trying to chide him, sounding like he's, you know, trying to get him into the ring. Do you have any reason to believe that we won't see a third fight between Fury and Wilder? No, no reason to uh, believe that it won't take place. It's just a matter of when. It, it is odd, Chris. I mean, we we both know Deontay Wilder very well. And it, to me, it's it's stunning. Like, I mean, it used to be no big deal to be able to reach out to his camp and get him on the phone for whatever subject was going on in the sport. And now he's unavailable. Now he's, all, you know, almost in hiding and being uh, very reclusive. And that's not who Deontay Wilder is. So that's a little bit concerning. How has this loss affected him? And it's almost like, you know, I'm not saying it's anywhere near the, the level of depression that Tyson Fury uh, went through after he defeated Klitschko. But you could maybe guess that there is some kind of depression going on with Deontay Wilder, this, this huge uh, blow to his ego and having to be now so humble uh, in defeat about what has happened because he was truly be- beaten down in this fight. And not a lot of people are accepting those excuses that he came up with afterwards. So how it plays out is going to be very interesting. You know, he's going to have to talk definitely within the next two months because he's going to have a fight to be, to be selling. Keith, there's obviously been no formal announcement. As we sit here in August, there's no rush. But does any of your reporting indicate there could be any kind of, of, of hang-up or any kind of possibility that we don't see Wilder uh, except that immediate third fight with Fury? No, I don't think that it, anything, it won't be related to Deontay Wilder if the fight does not happen by the end of this year. What could stop it from happening by the end of this year is whether fans can attend the fight, because as you guys well know, they did a $17 million gate roughly uh, for the rematch, and they're not going to have this fight without fans in attendance because they can't afford it. They, they, everyone lost money on the rematch. Uh, so they're not going to put themselves in position for that to happen again. But I have not been given any indication, although I have not spoken to Deontay Wilder. Look, I mean, there is a mental hurdle you have to get past to resume your career. And we know this because we just saw it. Like, we just saw Anthony Joshua go through it in 2019, getting knocked out, getting all the backlash, hearing from even some of your peers saying that you were overrated. Deontay Wilder himself, you know, went after Anthony Joshua in the aftermath of that fight. Uh, you've got to kind of dig deep into, I don't want to get too hyperbolic, but into your soul, so to speak, to bounce back from something like that. You've got to make some changes within your team, maybe not an overhaul, but some change with your team. So, you know, it's kind of, it kind of feels like we're seeing the process play out for the second time in as many years, Lance. I mean, do you think, do you see, you know, comparisons there with what AJ went through in the aftermath of the Ruiz loss to what we're at least seeing from afar, uh, Deontay Wilder go through? 
Absolutely. And to me, Chris, the beauty of the heavyweight division right now is that literally everywhere you look in this division, all of these guys have flaws that they have to overcome and conquer to, to stand as heavyweight champion. To me, it's like you could look out and say like the whole next decade is going to be filled with great heavyweight fights because of all, all of these characters involved. And, and each of them, you know, Andy Ruiz, Deontay Wilder, Dillian White, Tyson Fury, uh, Anthony Joshua, all have uh, questions and things about them where you say, you know, can he solve that tonight? And it's, it, to me, it's fascinating uh, theater to watch. I, I just can't wait for all, all these fights to go down because literally all these guys have some kind of demons that they have to dance with. Yeah, there's a half dozen heavyweight matchups I would love to see right now. And hopefully when this all clears up, we get good heavyweight fight after good heavyweight fight in 2021. It would do a lot to boost boxing. Um, all right, let me finish up with this, guys. I have in my rundown the topic name here. It's called Old Guy Boxing. So we're going to talk about old guys that are in or getting back into boxing, specifically Sergio Martinez, who at 45 years old, got back in the ring this past weekend to win a low-level fight over in Spain, and Oscar De La Hoya, who continues to make noise about getting back into the ring at 47 years old. So, Keith, I'll put it to you first. Who has a better chance at being successful? When I say successful, I'm not talking about the one win Sergio Martinez had, but successful at a medium to high level on their return to the ring. Sergio Martinez or Oscar De La Hoya? Well, I'll say Sergio Martinez, and only because I don't expect Oscar De La Hoya to fight. This is not the first time that he said he's coming back. When uh, He told Steve Kim uh, last week, I think it was, that he's going to fight. And I understand it became a big – it was on ESPN. And I said, well, he told Chris that a month before that on the podcast and also said that he would not discount Canelo as a potential opponent. I thought that <laughs> that was the yeah, – that's the biggest – that's the craziest thing that he said recently, right, that he would fight Canelo. I was yes. like, okay, if that happens, yeah, sure, I think the world would tune in for that. Now, <laughs> we all know that that is not going to happen. And I, as much as I think Oscar wants to come back in his mind, you know, the, the mind can't always will the body to do what it's not set out to do at this point. He's 47 years old. Uh, you know, he clearly is in much better physical condition than I am, but he's almost my age. I, I, he should not be boxing, certainly not against a top level guy. And, and I understand that he misses it and all that, um, but he hasn't fought in 12 years or almost 12 years. And the last time he fought, Manny Pacquiao beat the crap out of him. So why would anyone think that he would be able to come back in 2021 or whenever and fight a top-level guy, which is what he's saying that he's going to do? Again, I, I think, you know, he might want to do it. But he has said how many times now since losing to Manny Pacquiao that he's going to come back and he's going to spar and see how it goes and all that. He hasn't fought. Here, here we are almost 12 years later, and he has not fought. So unless he's going to fight some equally old person or middle-aged, per, however you want to frame it, I don't see him fighting again. So I guess by default, Sergio Martinez would be more successful. Lance, let me, um, you know, I, I agree with Keith. The idea that, like, you know, Oscar's position that, like, I go back to 154 and I'll be much stronger, that it was just the seven pounds that was – what prevented him from performing better against Pacquiao is a little bit ludicrous, but you've covered Oscar longer than all of us, you know, being out there in Los Angeles, you've seen him as Keith said, hint at coming back before. I mean, does this feel any different to you? Do you, do you believe we'll see Oscar get back in the ring? I, I think, I think that he, he is as serious as he's been on all of these things that he's ever said. Remember he was going to run for president against Donald Trump and all these other crazy things that he has had to say about comebacks and all the sort um, yeah, I mean, I think that he would like to do this, but let's be honest, Chris. I mean, if he gets in the ring, this stuff's going to go downhill very, very quickly. And honestly, he would be best served to say, you know what, I'm going to, I'm going to fight just like I did in the Olympics. He's going to be a three, it's going to be a three round fight and that's it. Because look, whether it's Mike Tyson and Roy Jones or any of these older fighters who are uh, talking about fighting, their endurance is going to be, you know, laughable if, if, if this thing goes past four rounds. And so Oscar has to be very real. You know, look, if he's getting healthy by doing this, more power to him. I hope that it's helping him uh, clean up his act. But, you know, I, I just, I, I think he wants to do it. I think he's striving uh, to do it. But like he said, will he, will he get in the ring? If I had, if I had the bet, I would say no as well. Yeah. 
I mean, it's, it's a long way to go until he ultimately decides to get there. If I'm Oscar De La Hoya, I'm telling Oscar, work on promoting, man. Like, just don't, don't get, don't worry about fighting. Like, just stop quarreling with your fighters and start promoting them at a high level. I mean, you've got some big fights potentially coming up. You've got the most exciting young star in all of boxing in Ryan Garcia. Like, give, put all your energy behind that. You know, become like the Bob Arum of promoting Ryan Garcia. Talk to everybody about Ryan right. Garcia. Tweet constantly about Ryan Garcia. Mm-hmm. I mean, it just, the fighting, and I understand, I've had this conversation with Sergio Mora, that it's really hard for fighters to completely let it go, but he's got an opportunity to you know stay in the game at a pretty high level, promoting high-level guys. He's got the biggest star in boxing in Canelo. He's got the brightest young star, as I said, in Ryan Garcia. I mean, put your energy into that. Uh, Keith, we did see Sergio Martinez come back. He didn't look bad. I understand it's he wasn't going up against a, a top opponent, but he looked serviceable. He, he attacked the body. He moved around decently. Those knees are never going to get back to what they once were, and his movement never will be as great as it was when he was knocking out Paul Williams or beating Kelly Pavlik. But uh, it looked like he can still box a little bit. What are your expectations for Sergio Martinez over the next year? You know, I'm not sure, Chris. Just He's a little younger than Oscar, of course, but... Um... And he, and he looked fine in the fight. I've obviously fought a, a very low level of opposition there. But, um, you know, if he fought, I think there's one fight that could be intriguing for him. If he was going to fight a guy who's, you know, younger than him and still, I don't know if he's at the top level based on what, he, what he's done, but, but uh, m- meaning uh, Julio Cesar Chavez Jr. That, that rematch would be sellable because obviously Chavez heard him at the end of that fight and I guess, you know, it, it, but I, I have the same concerns for Martinez. Martinez doesn't need the money. You know, he's done very well with his money, according to what Lou DiBella and others have told me. He's a very popular person in Argentina, uh, you know, like a transcendent mainstream star in Argentina. Apparently, he does some acting. He, do, he doesn't really need the money, from what I've been told. Um, but I, I would have the same concerns for him if he fought a, a younger guy in his prime that I would have for Oscar. And that's, more than anything, why you wouldn't want Oscar to go fight. I mean, it's, it's it, it, like Lance said, it's good if, he, if it's helping him stay he- healthy, both physically and mentally and all to train. But you get in a real fight with a guy who can punch who's, you know, 30 years old or whatever. I mean, you could obviously get very uh, seriously injured. So those are the concerns I would have about both guys fighting anyone that's in his physical prime and is a top-level fighter. So I, I would prefer that Martinez stayed away from anyone like that and and honestly stayed away from it. I, he, he got it out of his system, right? I mean, he fought for the first time in six years. He came back from from losing the fight against against Cotto, and he won a fight. So now his last fight is a win instead of a loss. Hopefully that makes him feel a little better about the end of his career. But I just worry just physically about these guys getting injured. It's just not necessary. And Oscar, I don't think Oscar needs the money either. I mean, I, I, so... I, I would just prefer them not to do it because no good could come of it ultimately. When they Lance, announced, when, when yeah, they announced the uh, Tyson Jones thing, it sounded as if, as if Mike Tyson was intending to start basically like a, a league for older fighters. Mm-hmm. And I'm not saying that's a bad idea. If guys are, you know, hurting financially, uh, Keith, if they need, if they need that money, no. this, this may be a good opportunity for them to be, get in there and fight each other. But, you know, taking on anyone in their peak, like you say, I think it's just a dangerous task. Yeah, I'm not. I'm not sure. I need a league of extraordinarily older fighters. I don't know if I need that in my life. I just. It's, it's not. You know. It's not look, like. It's not like baseball. Like it's not. It's not a sport that you can't get hurt in. Even if you're 50 something years old, you know your punch resistance ain't what it used to be, and you can get brain damage. Like I just. But but Chris, didn't didn't you see the 10 second clips of Mike Tyson in his living room? He's back. Amazing. He's back. It's all the way back. It's back. <laughs> Lance, uh, Keith brought up. Julio Cesar Chavez Jr. And I know he's toxic right now, but despite like the social media criticism of him, if Chavez wins a fight and maybe two low level fights, and if Martinez wins a low level fight, I'm with Keith. You can sell that fight. You, you can, can sell the rematch. It's it's cartoonish in a way, but there would be pretty significant interest in that fight if you put it like in Southern California in the spring of 2021. Like I I don't know about you, but that's like I I don't know what I don't know what the consequences of it would be. Neither one of these guys is fighting for a world title, though. I guess maybe Chavez theoretically could, but I I think there'd be as much interest in that fight 
as many fights you could make in the early part of next year. Absolutely. I mean, one thing, I mean, and this happens a lot too in MMA, which I have covered. One thing you realize is that the skills may erode. You may see that a fighter is seriously decreasing in what, they're, uh, what they used to be, but their names never die. And their names always mean something. And if you can, you know, say, whether it's Mike Tyson versus Roy Jones, or Julio Cesar Chavez versus Sergio Martinez, that, that stuff still has selling power. And certainly anyone involved, you know, wants to try to cash in on that. Sound like one of the ironborn from Game of Thrones there, uh, Lance. Like, what is dead may never die? Like, isn't that their catchphrase? I don't know if you guys are Game of Thrones people, but yeah. I'm a massive Game of Thrones people. Uh, Keith, last question for you. The, you know, we're, we're now talking about, we did Tyson Jones and Oscar and Chavez. Like, is... Is it an issue for boxing that we're exploiting the past? And I don't say we like the media, but like boxing, the, the biggest amount of interest is in it exploiting its past. And I'm not saying there wouldn't be interest in, you know, retired athletes in other sports. Like if Michael Jordan was like, I'm coming back, there'd be huge interest in that. But, you know, boxing is trying to get on its feet with, uh, you know, younger fighters. And most of the interest is in older fighters. I mean, is that a significant issue to you? Well, I, I think... I don't know, because, you know, Mike Tyson is such an anomaly in the sense that he was a phenomenon in the 80s. And, and really, the interest in Mike Tyson has never really wavered, despite him losing to Vander Holyfield twice, especially in the infamous way that he lost in the rematch, getting knocked out by Lennox Lewis, getting knocked out by Danny Williams, losing to Kevin McBride when he quit on his stool. Fifteen years later, people are still fascinated with whatever Mike Tyson is doing, whether he's swimming with sharks or growing pot in his backyard or whatever he's, <laughs> whatever it is he's doing, people are fascinated with Mike Tyson. So I think I'm not surprised by that. So, so it doesn't, I wouldn't say I'm alarmed in any way that people are more interested in what Mike Tyson's doing than what Jamal Charlo was doing or Javante Davis. I'm not knocking them. It's just that Mike Tyson is, is a cultural icon despite all of the crazy and in some cases criminal things that he has done in his life. Uh, people are just never going to stop being interested in Mike Tyson. So I don't know necessarily, you know, if Roy Jones, of course, a very popular fighter, a legendary fighter, but if Roy Jones were not fighting Mike Tyson, that event, and who knows whether it's still going to come off. Um, but I don't think there would have been as much interest in that event if Mike Tyson wasn't involved in it. So I think you know, if it was, if it was Tyson Holyfield, of course, there would have been a lot of interest in that. But, um, you know, if Shannon Briggs comes back, okay, people might write about it. Some people might want to see it. I don't know why necessarily, but, um, but it wouldn't be as big of a deal as Mike Tyson. So it, it doesn't, it, it, I don't think I'm as concerned about it as, as maybe people might think you should be if you cover this sport. I don't know about you guys, but I get regular emails from people telling me Shannon Briggs is coming back. And if I want to talk to Shannon Briggs, I'm I'm good with that at the moment. Uh, Lance, Lance, last question for you. Uh, you're in California. This is where that Tyson Jones fight was originally scheduled to, to take place next month. Uh, uh, allegedly going to take place on November 28th. Do you believe that Tyson Jones is going to happen? I would, you know, I, I think that they will. I think that for, for whatever was going on with some of the financial reasons, they had to get their house in order. I believe that they're doing that right now and that the intent is for this fight to still go down. That's what I've been told. and. Look, I mean, both of these guys are significant figures. They're making a documentary to, to help hawk it. And so um, the curiosity factor is so strong. You know, another thing is, you know, we don't know. I don't, I don't think that we'll be able to get fans in that venue, but it is an outdoor venue. They can spread them out a little bit. And a lot of people, I can assure you out here, are itching to try to uh, get tickets if, they're, if it's uh, possible. Oh, I know Keith is ready. He's the only one of us that has the Triller app already downloaded on his phone. Well, he's, uh, I certainly he's, do. I, I even know how to spell it now and what it is. But, uh, but I, I, I'm, I'm going to uh, respectfully disagree with my, my uh, friend Lance here, and I'm going to offer a friendly wager on dinner whenever we can go to <laughs> cover fights again uh, that this fight will not happen. Um, I just don't – you know, the excuse that they made when they postponed it seemingly a week after they announced it was that <laughs> that fans were not going to be able to come. <laughs> no shit. I mean, of course fans aren't going to be able to come. You knew that when you announced it. So what, so how is that the reason why it's, you know, and then Rory Jones started saying, if, if you don't pay me for whatever time I've committed to this so far, I'm going to back out. 
I think there are going to be a lot of financial issues in this moving forward. I, I don't care really if it happens or not. I'm not like a, a, against it happening. I mean, if it happens and people want to buy it, you want to waste 50 bucks watching Mike Tyson and Roy Jones look at each other and then have the referees step in as soon as they touch each other. <laughs> people waste their money on all kinds of crazy things. So good luck. But you know, I don't, I don't think it's going to happen. Though. Yeah. Well, it's, I'm, I'm, I'll make that dinner bet with Keith as well. Uh, I'll, I'll pay for the next one. If that's it's what it, happens. It's, a, it's my Go sunny, dis, it's my sunny disposition out here on the West coast versus <laughs> you negative <laughs> East coast guys. You know, you're it's just, you guys, fair you enough, guys, fair enough. You, you, you guys both like, we were all, we all kind of sniffed this for a few weeks before it got reported. The big thing was like, follow the money, right? Like I was, I was, I had heard they were going for the middle East and trying to make it happen, but the middle East wasn't interested. And, then the second they said Carson, California, September twelfth, in the middle of a pandemic, there's no way. And to your <laughs> point, to your point, Lance, they're not going to be able to have fans. Like the governor of California is not going to allow fans in California November twenty eighth. It's just not going to happen. Like it's just, and, and even if it did, like how much revenue is that going to be able to bring in to get to that reported fifty million dollar number to pay everybody off? I mean, Nate Robinson, as a basketball guy, he ain't doing this for free. Like he, <laughs> he's getting some money out of it. Jake Paul, you know. He's nuts, but he's getting some money out of it. I just, I, it, it all comes down to the money. I don't think it's there. I don't think this pot of money is there. And therefore, whether it's September, November, or 2076, if it's not, <laughs> the money is not there, it's just not going to happen. That's a conversation for, for another day, fellas. I uh, appreciate it. Great talk with you guys. This was awesome doing this. We'll have to do it again uh, real soon. Thanks to Keith Ideck and Lance Pugmire for joining me here on the show, fellas. Thanks, Chris. Thanks, Lance. Good to see you guys. Same here. Thank you so much, Chris.